going live. You're live. And we are live, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. This is Cosmography Live, the Randall Carlson podcast. Welcome back. We just got back from another excellent Scablands trip. We had a great group of people with us. Brad is still on the road, as you guys can see. Where, what are you, Brad? In a, are you in the back of your car? What is that? I'm in an RV that I've been tooling around for, mm. fortunately, for almost a month now, setting up uh, the next couple tours, hopefully, to uh, pull some of them off next next year. Ah. So I'm actually uh, overlooking uh, Lewiston, Idaho, and Clarkston, Washington, where the Snake River combines with the clear water hmm and so, so what is that part going to be part of another tour that one that area it's maybe it's kind of out by itself oh. uh it would be like the end of the bonneville flood tour but it's just too far away so yeah the the, the big site here is the tammany bar that we've been to multiple times and randall's talked about how the the Bonneville flood and the Missoula flood uh, debris and flows intermixed and overlaid. And uh, there was a very obvious uh, rock quarry where you could see that. And uh, it's actually last time I went through the quarry had moved that far up the hillside, the, the gravel bar finally. And that exposure that we looked at multiple times over 20 years is now gone. Yeah. So I was going to see if they, you know, they ripped off another face or somewhere that is is worthy of, you know, getting photographs and telling the story. Because we've said multiple times that somebody could have spent uh, a series of of their educational years and even a doctorate thesis, you know, determining what was going on in that in that exposure. Hey, in that one exposure, right. I might even pull up a pull up an image here. But, yeah, that was a great trip. I would mention, though, that actually, Brad, we're, just so people understand, that's just a set that Brad has in his apartment. Oh, it's a set. Is. Yeah. <laughs> that's the RV set. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Brad, do you want to give a scan of where you're at like you did earlier? Is that possible or is that just too It's kind of windy out there. Oh, no, I can't. It's, it's super windy. I could mute it. And, and walk out the door here yeah but it just seems like it's way delayed so uh you just have to tell me yeah go ahead and uh, do it if you mute it yeah all right yeah okay good so randall you're gonna pull up some pictures too well i might as well oh, look at that it's not it's definitely not muted <laughs> So if you look down in the center of the screen, that's Tammany Bar right there, right in the bend of the Snake River. He definitely didn't mute it, though. Sorry, folks. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get that memo. Listen, we're professionals here at uh, Cosmographia. <laughs> but you can see where the clear water is coming in from the from the left here. Yeah, that is a great view. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's actually more imp impressive when you're there in person. Absolutely, sure. Yeah. For but for a, a temporary period of time during uh, the great flooding, that whole thing was a gigantic lake out there. Man. Yeah. Again, it's it's you know it's we've been what we've been five times now. I mean, I know you guys, you Randall and Brad, have been a bunch of times, but. Uh, for us, that's our. I think this was our fifth trip, fourth uh -huh. or fifth trip, and still the scale is just it just hits you every time. And you're going through those canyons or those coulees, and you're looking at this <clears throat> enormous wall of rock way over here on this side, and then there's another enormous wall of rock way over there, and you know that the waters initially were flowing above all of that. You know, yeah, those yeah those canyons are down below ground, but the flood was initially on top before it channelized, oh. and just the scale is just. You know, and going through the fan, the erratics fan, it's just thousands and thousands of giant boulders spread through many square miles of 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 rolling fields. It's unbelievable, just the scale out there. It's it's just impossible to comprehend uh, the massive movement of water and materials that happened. It, it is, this, and, and really, events. 
think about, you know, we've only seen like in the trips that you, the five you've been on really, if we've only seen on those trips, a small part of it. Yeah. Cause I mean, think about all the sites we didn't go see just this last week. Right. There's uh, yes. We can only take, we can only take people to so many sites cause it's a lot of driving. So, you know, we're hitting the big ones, the highlights. So yeah, I know there's not, there's lots of sites we don't get to go see during the tours. But still, I didn't say that though to make you feel bad. No, I was just trying to I, make a point. I that... want. I just kind of want to go home now, Randall. I don't feel good anymore. I was thinking I felt great about the trip, and now you just make me want to. Want to I quit. I quit. <laughs> What's happening there, Kyle? Is your brother going woke on us? <laughs> yeah, hadn't had enough coffee. It's the opposite of woke. He's going to sleep. <clears throat> Give that boy some coffee, quick. So I got something here, um, what Brad was talking about. Let me see if I can uh, get this to work screen two. Let's check this out and see if this works. All right. Are you seeing a... Yep. Tammany Bar from the West. Tammany Bar from the West. Whoops. What happened there? Do an instant fix. Tammany Bar from the West. From the West. Tammany Creek is coming in there, yeah. Yeah, this is Tammany Creek coming in here. The Snake River is just out of sight down here. And uh, you can see the bar right here. It's always it's the flat shelf-like feature right in here, and it actually wraps around. Right up in here, there's some borrow pits that we've stopped at. And, man, you can see uh, probably, yeah, well, I think this is it right here. Um, boy, you can really see a cross-section. just Randall, like if, you're, if you're using your cursor, we can't see it. For some reason, I don't see it on this screen. Oh, there it is. There, oh, there, there it is. is. There it is. Okay, yeah. there's Tammany Creek right there. And here's the shelf. Outside. This is the bar, and it kind of wraps around. And right here, I believe it's right here, and maybe there's another one up here. There's some um, there's some borrow pits that uh, that they're that um, they've taken sand because when you get up right in here, it's just sandy. The 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 uh, there may be a few scattered rocks uh, strewn throughout it. But for the most part, it's all sandy, and it washed right on up around here. The creek has exposed it in multiple places. But right down here, Snake River, just out of sight. And then if I go to the next one, there's the arrow. All right. Yeah, so there's the panorama of Tammany Bar. And can you, can you zoom in on that picture for us? Oh, it's in presentation mode. Okay. Yeah, it's in presentation. But yeah, actually, it's cool. I'll the next slide is zoomed in. So, okay. but this gives you here. You can see it very plainly displayed. The very two to very distinct types of sediment. And on the next one, you'll be able to see the four sets uh, much clearer. But when you do, you'll see that this one has four sets dipping to the north. So. This is the Bonneville floods coming in this way, and then this is the Missoula floods that are back flood. This is slack water. This is very stilling water for the Missoula floods, and it's all silt, silty stuff, sandy stuff, and there's a very distinct change in gradation right here that'll come up, and you can see Mark Lamanto, the late Mark Lamanto, um, in the picture for scale. That was a sad day. We lost one of our one of our crew members. He was only on one trip, but right after this picture was taken, the, the cliff collapsed on him, and that was the end of him. No, that was a bit of humor <laughs> at Mark's expense. He really is gone, and I really, you know, I really liked the guy. I didn't get to know him like I really would have liked to. Um, but yeah, he was fired up, man. He wanted to go on another trip, and he God, I don't remember what happened. He got, I think it was some kind of cancer. I mean, he was mm. strapping and healthy, but um, anyhow. Yeah, it was pretty sudden. But, yeah, he was a great addition that trip. He was uh, very he was. curious and uh, asked some excellent questions and really got you talking at several sites. Uh, he's the one that was with us when we found the uh, Mount St. Helens ash yep. layer there at uh, yep. yeah, the Yakima River. Yep. Randall, what is slack water? Lack water is water that's just been flowing and it's like in a basin or in a it's back flooding into a low area or a tributary and it's just 
slowing down to the point where it's hardly moving at all. Mm. It's just slacking, slacking off. <laughs> it just lo- kind of... So it could be moving, but it's moving very slowly. So slack water is you're going to have a lot of fine suspended sediment, which you we've all seen in various types of, you know, um, if you've see, ever seen any water that's had a lot of sediment in, you know that after it's drained away, it leaves a layer of sediment. So this picture is pretty, you can see the transition very distinct. Now, what's, what do you think is interesting? What, see if you find uh, the same thing that I find to be interesting when you look at this. I mean, there's multiple things. but large, The large boulders at the very top as opposed to the bottom of that sediment layer. Yeah, yeah. Which is, so, suggests that there was like a major rush at the end. At the of end, the deposition. yes. Yeah, well, yeah. I was and thinking the other thing well, isn't this isn't this both sorry isn't this both floods? So yes, maybe this is both floods. Yeah, so maybe there's a major rush in the middle of the Bonneville flood, and then it deposits more sediments on top of that. But then the Missoula flood goes on goes the other direction and pushes some of that away, erodes it away down well, to the big that's, boulders. Okay, that's not too likely. Not likely. And the reason it's not likely here. If there was more current, yes, but see, there's almost no current here. The current, I see that. Yeah, it is very. Yeah, okay. the bon- the the top see, floods no. look like uh, they've got rhythmites too that are large and then get small at the top before yeah. the lust deposit. Yes, and if you look here, this is not you can't quite see it, but you can see there's you can you're right. There's layers here, which represent surges of like muddy water just sloshing up. Sloshing up and, and basically coming to an end right here and a little bit to the south. And that's is pretty much because remember Lions Ferry where we had lunch. Okay, so the remember on the other side of the Snake River, the two great bars that are there. Remember that, guys? No. Uh. <laughs> the two big, the two big, the the bridge goes across to one of them. Picture we're at Lions Ferry, right? Off to the right, there was a big gravel bar on the other side of the river, a couple of miles long. Not on the scale of West Bar, but the but it still was a huge one. And then then uh to the left there was another one, and I was explaining that that was the material that was washed out in the carving of uh Palouse Canyon. You guys don't remember that? Okay. Mm-hmm. Really? We were working, bro. Sorry. Take your word for it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a... <laughs> I was undoubtedly <laughs> okay, but <laughs> they're more visible from the train bridge. Not really Lions Ferry, but uh, we stopped right under that big uh, truss for. Okay. I remember yeah, you, truss, yeah. Now you you do we remember that we yes. stopped by the big right. So if you're standing there and you're looking down at the river on on your left, which would be to the east, came uh, the Palouse River. Yep. And then right across from there, up, uh, upstream of the snake for about a mile and a half or so is a huge bar with a gravel bar that actually has current ripples on the top of it, but they've been obscured for some reason. Um, I think there was, I wonder if they were growing crops or something industrial. I don't remember what it was going on there that kind of obscured the current ripples, but going back to this, here's, here's what I think is a possibility is that. You've got what this is telling us. I'm thinking is that at some point upstream, which is probably down in Idaho, assuming pretty assuredly that it was in Idaho, or some of these boulders um, would have come up out of Idaho, and some of them probably came from uh, Hell's Canyon. But it would be very interesting to do the petrology and find out. You know, do the uh, the provenance is actually the term you use. The provenance of these boulders that would tell you where they came from. Yeah, what the source is, yeah. Exactly. So undoubtedly, obviously, so there was a a major current right at the end, and it deposited these boulders, and there may have been finer stuff. However, you would see an intermingling if there was fine um, Bonneville sediments that were of roughly the same texture as the Missoula sediments, you would see an intermingling of them. Because, again, this water is not rushing through. It's right. just coming in in this 
very slowly, like a muddy, big muddy pond right here. But could Remember it, I but said that there was it, a big lake out there when, when you're looking at the overlook? So this was like underwater. Could could we, this second flood, though, on this picture have been moving fast at first and then slow? Oh, down it was and, moving fast at first, 120 miles west of here. Okay. Right there at, at, at the, that's why I was calling your attention to those two big boulder bars. Yeah. Splayed out from the mouth of the Palouse River okay. because that shows really energetic. But, but bear in mind... This the waves of muddy water that you're seeing here that are the part of the Missoula flood. They're moving backwards. They're moving upstream. They're moving uphill to get to here. The other thing is, is if it, if if this top flood was slow and calm, and there had been any like good length of time between the two floods, then the top sediment layers of the first flood should have plenty of vegetation that would not have been washed away in a That's slow right. approaching that flood. That's right. And so that, they need Kyle, to be close yes. in That's time. That's exactly what I've been saying. You hit the nail on the head. You no. get 1.5 attaboys <laughs> for that. That was a good one. Listen, Jack I've Bob. told you. When, <laughs> you know, when credit is due, I will give credit. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, look at this boulder. I, you know, I'm really, that's what where Brad was saying. You could do a whole study. You could do a whole PhD dissertation on this outcrop right here. And then I don't know if you've got to zoom in on that, but the, a lot of those in that, in that border divider are really rounded and smooth. Yeah. Uh, they had, they had sorted them out and uh, there were separated piles after this wall had been taken down and I probably have some photographs of those, but they were, you know, like egg smooth. I hope, I hope that the company has a geologist on staff that's keeping track of this because yeah, I mean, this is such an amazing outcrop here because uh, let's go to the next amazing thing about it. Look at the top. Do you notice a transition? Yep. From from horizontal to vertical. Yep. Yeah. So what's going on there? Well, that's the I mean, can I say it? Are you Yeah, you, uh, yeah that's the lust deposit at the top. That is yeah. the lust deposit. Now see, so think about this. Okay, so at the point now this is stuff this is stuff that's coming out of the atmosphere. That's how it got it, it where wherever it originated from. It was in the atmosphere when it was deposited on top of this uppermost flood layer. Or was it? That's the thing. It, it, you can't say it was transported by water because it would be no different than what's below it if it was transported by water. What, what distinguishes LUS is exactly what you said. It's that vertical structure that's inherent in it. And how do you explain that? That, that, that is a very interesting unanswered question in uh in geology and geomorphology that looks at the origins of landscapes so this stuff came out of the atmosphere but in what form was it deposited as dust and why would wind create this vertical structure if it's just wind deposited dust that's weird because yeah we have plenty of examples of wind deposited uh grains yeah. and they're yeah. always they're more like the bottom layer down there with these angled yeah the, yep. dune, the dunes yeah uh yes yes striations so i think that it's a hybrid i think that it's that's why i've said i think that you could say that it would be kind of um a precipitation out of the atmosphere of this material um almost like as a muddy rainfall and this stuff, you know, it, look at it. It's five feet thick up there. Now, that's a lot of stuff to come out of the atmosphere. That's a lot of stuff. You put five feet of stuff like that. I mean, think about volcanic ash layers that can turn day into night, and they're six feet thick or, a, I mean, it's, sorry, six inches thick or a foot thick, you know, hundreds or several hundred miles away from the, the source, the volcanic source. I mean, that's what happened uh, in eastern Washington when Mount St. Helens erupted back in 1980. Turned day into night. 
Now, what would what would five or six feet of material in the atmosphere, what effect would that have on the atmosphere? And how long was it up there before it came down? And was it coming down during the floods? Because if it was coming down during the floods, it's going to get incorporated into the, you know, into those ryth- rhythmical deposits there, and you're not going right. to, you're not going to see it. It would then be laid down by water. That's right. So this is stuff that came out of the atmosphere. Sub-aerial. It may have been coming out of the atmosphere during the flood period, the flood episode. So, you know, which raises another question: What was the duration of time? you know, for the entire flood episode here to be laid down. Is this, is this one back flood? It looks to me like one back flood. I don't really see anything that looks like evidence that it was multiple floods. Maybe. I mean, it, it you'd looks- have to interpret each of these as an, uh, a, a, an individual flood. I don't know if anybody's doing that. Maybe I Maybe like don't- individual Flow, flows of water coming in with more material and dropping it down. It looks pulsed. Yeah, in, pulsing. In well, yeah, that's that's the pulse, how that's I a single it. event. Yeah. yeah, it looks like the pulses sort of ramp up and then and then they, and, and then go back and then down. They, yeah, and then they go back down, it's and the final flows of water coming because picture this water is kind of like sloshing. It's coming up. It's probably flowing back out, but the it's not just one surge coming down the Palouse river there it's multiple surges of water and if you've got if this is a a a large scale melting event well you're going to have some sources of water that are going to be hundreds of miles closer potentially than other sources of water so you're going to have it's it's going to be an extremely complex flood uh, uh diagram that you're trying to draw with this thing um Anyhow, look at the bottom. Let's zoom in on that. Well, real quick, uh, our buddy Kyle DeLille. What's up, bro? He uh, he donated fourteen forty, fourteen dollars forty cents. He says just cause. Then later he donated another fourteen forty. He said to pay for another half an attaboy for Kyle so he can have two full attaboys. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> he's looking out for. <laughs> well. Uh, <laughs> hmm. I don't know if this is ethical or not. Uh, yeah, I don't. <laughs> he's, he sounds seems, like bribery. It, see, it sounds like he's trying to establish the cost of a full attaboy. Is <laughs> <laughs> well, let me twenty eight eighty. Let me consider it. Yeah, twenty eight eighty. Uh, I was going to comment on that. Fourteen forty. <laughs> we can comment on that as well. We could come back to that. Why don't we comment on this first? And also, pushing wind gave ten dollars. Says beer money. So there you go. Thank you guys. And is also a mod in the chats. Thanks yes. for that. Yes. Max, okay. Kyle DeLille needs to be a mod. Why yeah. isn't he a mod Somebody yet? Somebody make him a mod. Yeah, let me figure that out. Some person in charge needs to, uh, <laughs> needs to do that. So check this out. You see the four sets? This is also, a, you know, worthy of some pretty intense deciphering here because you've got multiple surges coming from the right. Can you see that? The tilting downward is... That's a paleo current indicator. You've got the dipping of the strata of the sedimentary bedding tilts down in the direction of the flow. And you can actually see, look at here, you got, look, you can see there's a, a flow here. Then you got another flow. And then that flow is, is doing exactly what you were talking about earlier. Um, Russ, because this is a case where you do have the the older flows being truncated by the younger flows. That's happening here. And that's okay. because the water here is moving relatively fast compared to the water up on top, the the buff colored silt. Yeah, didn't you say you could you could judge roughly judge the speed by the yeah. the steepness of the angle? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes. You can roughly do that. Right. And we have a question too when you're when you're ready about this okay jordan Notice r- right up in the corner up here you've got the you can see the the missoula silts oh yeah yeah so uh okay so here we go this is um this is what i was talking about this is the deposits that you find up creek in tammany creek and they're all you can see they're all check this out 
So the whole story of this event, you've got right here, what's cool about this is this is where you can see the flow actually changing direction. It's You've got coming. the same kind of uh, micro scale laminations too at uh, Burlingame Gulch. What yes. Is the scale there. So this is like a, a, a cross section, like a flash flow frozen picture of the flows, the actual flows. This is what's going on in the water and all of this fine, fine material in this slowly moving water where you've got pulses of water moving in one direction and then moving in the other direction. Okay, so. Do you want to get to this question? It's about this topic, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, sure. It's Let's... a super chat donation question. Yeah. Now that it's gone. Right here, it's a, I pulled it up. Yeah, so from Jordan, he gives 10 bucks, says, is the smaller striations at the main boundary caused by the disruption of flow due to boulders on top? And is the top layer similar to dried pluff mud uh, from Charleston, South Carolina? Love you guys. Like in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, sorry, like in Charleston, South Carolina. Yep. And what pluff, kind of mud? Pluff, P-L-U-F-F, -F, dried. P-L-U-F-F, -F, you mean... Uh possibly being the same type of material as the loss? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Is the top well, layer similar to dried pluff mud? Okay, dried pluff mud. I've never heard of pluff mud. Let's see if it's in the Great. book of let's geologic Let's look in terms. the, uh, yeah, let's consult the book of knowledge over here. <laughs> yeah, pluff. That's interesting. So, um, possibly. I haven't... Uh, I don't see it in the book. I'll look it up. I'll look it up on. Hmm. I don't think we'll get into this tonight. Although it sure is interesting stuff. It is interesting stuff. Uh, we also got uh, real quick. Oh, you found something? Well, uh, it's, it's what pops up on Brave. Okay. Because I don't Google. <laughs> <laughs> Pluff mud also known as plow mud, is a dark to light brown gooey soft mud that can sometimes be clay-like in appearance and consistency. It is composed primarily of decaying matter, creating a miasma that lines the coast and comprises the floors of low country salt marshes. Hmm. So I would say the answer is no, they're no, not the same thing. It's not the same, yeah. But I, I'm appreciate learning about pluff mud yes the, the entirety of the low country salt marshes ecosystem is built off of pluff mud say say that again i want to get that the entire uh so let's back up a little bit um yeah it says okay so the entirety of the low country yeah. salt marshes ecosystem is built off of pluff mud charleston south carolina okay okay it's uh It comprises the floors of low country salt marshes. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, we've established it's term. not the same as loss. But I I did not know what pluff mud was. Now, what is the origin? It said that it's, what's the origin of it? Although I can have a pretty good, I mean, I can imagine. It's pretty... decaying matter. Yeah, it's very organic. Yeah. Creating so, the is there evidence that it was ever below sea level? Hmm. I would have to look into this. Um, that's not. It's not. Nothing says. Not right off the bat. I have to dig deeper. Because when you get into the, see, here's another issue that I find fascinating is when you start looking at what's happening ecologically, and you know when uh, sea levels are shifting by hundreds of feet, either up or down. Right now, it's fairly stable, right? But if if you've got 420 feet or so of sea level change, they're, they're, imagine how rapidly and dynamic the coastlines are going to have to be to adapt to that. So, um, so yeah. Anyhow, 
Uh, what was the next question? We've established that. Was there more to that question? No, that was it. Well, the other part of the question was about the first part of it. This is the smaller striations at the main boundary caused by the disruption of flow due to boulders on top. Um, okay, so the boulders on top of the... Uh, of the lower flood materials. Yeah, so yeah. I'm going to go back to that image there. All right, and I do have more pictures closer up of the, which I did stick in the slideshow. Um, but anyways, yeah, see, you can see the boulders. Look here, if you look close, and I wish I did have a... Uh, well, let's see, maybe I could do this. I could... Uh, let's see if I... If I go back to edit mode, I could actually zoom in, I believe. Chat's having fun with the pluff mud term. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't trying pluff, pluff to pass. direct the whole topic of this live show. That's just where I'm at. But it's it fine, is Brad. interesting. Yeah, it's good stuff. Oh no, How man. You, Brad. <laughs> no, it's Unacceptable. okay, Brad. We I don't mind talking about it at all. I've been looking at all this. Right. Um, what I was going to say was, if you, you can actually see in this, is that some of these boulders are actually up into the Missoula flood muds. You see that? They're actually up in it. Yes. So what it looks like is that this was probably a landscape, sub a sub-aerial landscape. And you know what I mean by sub-aerial, right? Yep. In the in air. In the atmosphere. Not right. submarine, sub-aerial in the air. <laughs> Right, that you could probably walk over with great difficulty because it's going to be a massive boulder field. And then this other stuff, this muddy water comes spilling in from the west and from the north, which is the back flood of the water that produced Cheney Palouse Scabland Tract. So there's undoubtedly a lot of this muddy material was stripped of, had loss in it, right? Because think about all of the topsoil that was removed, the lust topsoil that was removed in the um, in the carving out of the Cheney Palouse Scabland. Remember, we saw the 200-foot hills of it that were had been washed away. Well, a lot of that stuff is what's up here in these muds. So one of the things that would have happened, and this is why, ah, see, this is the thing. I would have just loved to have spent, you know, a week or two at least just looking over this whole thing with – you know, and making close-up examinations. Um, but what this would do would be to introduce some kind of turbulence. But there's not really any signs of turbulence yeah, doesn't look that like I it. can see from here, yeah. which, again, would be consistent with this the water that deposited this stuff moving really slow. Um, so. Brad, did you say that this is gone, this... Uh... Well, I think they've quarried more. Since quarried then. more of it out. Okay, yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. That that whole exposure is not there anymore. It's been dug down and sorted and in piles and probably all trucked away by now. A so very that's, what I was gonna, that's what I was going to do over here. I was going to drive by and see if there is something new exposed that we could check or see see the same evidence or something different even. So. Let's go upstream of the Bonneville flood a ways and uh, look at what kind of sediment is being carried in the floodwaters. You seeing it? Yeah, we're seeing it. Okay. Look at the, this one's busted, of course, but look at look at the roundness of this. These boulders have been They've been transported. You don't see a single, unless it's broken. Like you see, this is probably broken. This is probably the piece of it laying right here. But you can see how rounded these boulders are. So these boulders have been ripped up and transported, I mean, miles from wherever it was that they were first quarried by the flood. So we're standing here kind of looking down current, downflow. The flow came from behind the photographer. So this is this is the Bonneville flood, and this this is this stop would be included in any tour we did. People need to see this. This is the Swan Falls Boulder Bar. It's a very impressive ge geomorphic feature in the landscape. That's for sure. When you see something like this displayed out three miles in front of you, 
yeah, it's just really, it's just, it's humbling because you begin to understand how truly awesomely powerful these events were. Like you said, that definitely would be part of a Bonneville flood tour uh, that would start in Salt Lake City where, uh, right, Salt Lake is the little puddle left over of the huge giant Lake Bonneville that yep. then flooded out and dropped its level 400 feet after busting through at Red Rock Pass, which would also be part of the tour. Um, what what you haven't seen that uh, we found out about is there's a there's a park 12 miles downstream from that Swan Falls Boulder Bar, and it looks a whole lot like the Afrata fan that we just went to a couple of days ago. And those those rocks, the basalt rocks, are extremely rounded, but they're wow. everywhere. They're not as large as the ones here, but there's many more, and they're over a much bigger territory. And that would that would also be part of the the tour. Yeah. That's called Celebration Park. There's actually some really ancient uh, petroglyphs there that they haven't deciphered or even given a guess on how old they are. Uh huh. You can see the human figure here. That's probably our friend Wilbur, right there, for scale. So, yeah. Russ, just you know, wrap your head around that the, <laughs> the kind of flood that rushes through well see here's the other thing you look at this picture and this the canyon itself is mostly a product of the flood so there was undoubtedly a snake river a pre-flood and antediluvian snake river hmm. but it would have been way up there now these cliffs here are about 400 feet in this reach of the snake river and it's likely that the snake well, just just like we've been seeing in the coulees of eastern Washington, the um, the bedrock layers are uh, you know move across here and are on the other side. So, first of all, the flood came in and ripped out the canyon, and then the final stage. This is like the final act of the flood is it's dumping this stuff. So. And there again, now this, it's very clear from here, these cliffs are perfectly vertical. But you see the, this is where the question came, is this, uh, is Washout this, uh, yeah. right, it has to be. And you find that, any, and so you can see this even in smaller, much smaller uh, scales as well. So the water is choked with this stuff, and as it's coming around, it's leaving this stuff flanked up against the see you could move this stuff and the cliff would go straight down to the bottom so it has to cut the cliff first right and then as it begins to slow down maybe at the end of the flood as it starts to at the end of the uh, flood that's exactly right okay, and, yeah. and the floor see here's the thing this stuff it, it doesn't just stop here it's not like it, it continues down yeah. And this floor is made out of the same it's, stuff right the floor is the rest of the dropped materials <clears throat> at the, at you the got, very yes. end yeah yep right. Which leaves it flat and fertile and relatively uh, nice yeah. for the next <laughs> civilization that comes along to try to use it. <laughs> and these these are some of the back flood sediments here. I mean, that's that stuff there is probably 120 feet thick at least. So, you know, again, to, you got a picture. You got a main flow. And it's moving pretty fast, and then it's back flooding up into valleys and tributaries, and leaving huge thick layers of muddy deposits. Ah, you recognize this? Ah, oh, yeah. That's Tammany Bar. Here's 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 the snake coming up out of Hell's Canyon off the screen back here. But yeah, there's the bar comes wrapping right around, and here's the gravel pit right in here. You can see it right in there. And there's your, there's your topo map right there. And all of this wrapped around here is the bar. Here's the creek comes in here from the east. And that gr whole gravel bar is all in here. And then those fine-grained sediments with that really fine structure that we saw, showing that the, the surging and the final stilling of the waters and reversal of direction, that's right in here. Because 
as the floods came down, that water back flooded. And I would imagine that if you hiked up here, you'd find that um, prob those kind of sediments going way back, probably a half a mile or a mile up creek in here. There's a road that goes in here, and as I recall, there were some road cuts, and you could probably find the, the, the final limit of the Missoula back flood up in here, um, or find very close, because there are road cuts. So that would be an interesting excursion to make that and actually mark where where did the back floods of the Missoula floods, where did they finally end? Where did they finally reach their distal, most great distance from the source, at which point the current would have turned around and then flowed back out? Because all that water that was in this basin ultimately, you know, flowed back out down the snake. And now that raises the question of Lake Lewis. Remember what Lake Lewis was? Lake Lewis was in the Pasco Basin. The water, that's the name given to the water that would have pooled above Wallula Gap. So that raises another interesting question. Was this water coming up out of Idaho, where did it fit in that sequence? Was it contribute? Did it contribute water to the filling of Lake Lewis? I don't know. And there we've seen that, so we don't need to. So yeah, it was every trip. You know, I get new insight. Um, that's that overview there in that great bend, that ninety degree bend of Moses Cooley. That's pretty impressive view when you stand there and you realize how the water came from the left and sloshed around that corner. I got photographs where you can actually see, and once you be, think about the water moving around that corner, and you see those, remember, I, we probably have it on photographs or video, those huge hummocky deposits that were right in the bend as you go. You can almost picture how that water carrying down just washed that stuff up into that into that curve there. Yeah, it was uh, pretty impressive, I got to say. And uh, so the thing about, other thing I find interesting, I was thinking about lately a lot about, you know, in terms of that glacial, interglacial oscillations and the rise and fall of sea level. Because in your mind, picture the animate, run the animation in your, in your mind. You're looking at, let's say, a map of the Western Hemisphere. And as the gr glaciers are growing, right, the glaciers are growing bigger. What's also happening, it, the, the coastlines are moving seaward. So you, as they're growing, and there's going to be a direct relationship between the speed at which the glaciers grow, the sea level drops, and the coastlines migrate, right, and and vice versa. Now, I was thinking in terms of how that, how what that does in terms of the ecology of the coastline when you've got 400 feet of sea level changing over a matter of a few thousand years. I mean, that creates a dynamic coastline that's way more active than what we're seeing today with a rise of what, 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 eight inches in the last century, roughly eight inches in the last century. Um, and then more or less stable for the last three or 4,000 years, right? Sea level is oscillated, but it's been more or less stable. But in the early Holocene thermal maximum, it was as two, three, four feet higher than now, higher than now during the Holocene. We'll have to mm -hmm. talk about that. I've got a whole set of, uh, papers that have come out on sea levels and there is really uh, convincing evidence that sea levels have been two, four, five, maybe even six feet higher than now in the Holocene thermal maximum. But not only <clears throat> is that change in sea level, I've been pondering how that is going to affect coastal ecologies and how that in turn is going to affect shallow marine ecologies as the as the um, the sea level is rising and falling and migrating across the coastline. The other question in my mind has been, how has that affected human culture in the sense that, and then it dawned on me that if you've got a full-blown ice age, you've got large land masses that are connected, 
that during an interglacial, when the sea levels rise, those land masses are disconnected. Right. So if you're, let's say, you know, if you're living anywhere, let's say you're living on the British Isles during late glacial maximum, right? The British Isles are connected to the European mainland. Yeah. So let's assume you've got people living there and they're, they're mobile enough that they can migrate across if they're, if they're nomadic hunters. Well, they may be moving across what is now, um, and we know they were in Doggerland, right? <clears throat> so if you've got a culture that's living in a geographical area next to the ocean, and then the ocean level rises, and it does it fast enough that the memory of that, as, as it rises, just like it did with England, or all kinds of islands, is that the, it rises, <clears throat> and what had been contiguous land masses are now islands. So what happens to the people in those regions? Well, they could migrate out of there, of course, but it's also possible that people would be finding themselves isolated on islands, right? But here's the thing. With a fast sea level rise, right, you're going to probably have the memory of the fact that, yeah, there's an ocean here, but on the other side of that ocean, that that water right there, maybe 20 or 30 or 40 miles away, there's another landmass. You know that, you know, yeah. because it's only a few generations earlier that they were connected. Right. So your great grandparents and their parents and so on were occupying that land that's now drowned. Right. So you know that there is a, another landmass on the other side of that body of water. You now have a pretty big incentive to figure out and come up with ways of crossing that body of water. Yeah. Because it's not, you're not sailing out into the unknown. So now you've got a motive, and it's also assumable, presumably much easier because the distances are shorter. Because, um, you know, these, the, the material that's coming out now that's showing that, um, you know, seafaring was a capability that our ancestors had back to 65,000 years ago. So if they were able to island hop 65,000 years ago, is it such a stretch that somewhere in there you would have had a culture with seafaring capabilities that could have made transoceanic voyages? I don't think that that's such a fringe idea. So there's, let's see, I think I've got something right here about a recent, uh, yeah, I think this is it. Let's see. Um, they were doing it so like this was, this was in the newsletter that I just put out. And this is why people should subscribe to the newsletter. It's free for crying out loud. Okay. The question of when early humans first developed the navigating skills to become seafaring is an especially fascinating and important one. A mass of accumulating evidence points to a remote period going back at least 65,000 years ago when the first peopling of Australia took place. So this was just this la this month's issue of Quaternary Science Reviews. This report was in there. It's uh, Patrick Morrison, Michael O'Leary, and Joe McDonald with respectively the Center for Rock Art Research with the University of Western Australia uh, in the Earth Sciences Department of the same name and the University of uh, Wales, I guess. Is there a Wales in Australia? Anyways, there's U the UWA Oceans Institute. So their conclusion was it was first this settlement, this uh, seafaring capabilities was affected during much lowered sea level. Um, then with the rise in sea level at the end of the glacial age, many islands were drowned and other land masses, which were connected to the mainland, became separated. Now, this was happening all over the world. This is this is referring to Australia, um, but this was happening all over the world. So this led to an apparent change in the Holocene archaeological record, suggesting that, and this is quoting from the uh, paper, Many Australian islands were abandoned for several thousand years after separation 
from the mainland and only visited again in the last few thousand years. The implications is that the implication is that coastal peoples reintroduced watercraft into their maritime repertoire only in the recent past. Um, as the authors point out, since first peopling, sea levels have fluctuated over 120 meters, transforming the coastlines and offshore island geography. So in this particular case, there were people living on these islands, and then they were abandoned um, after separation from the mainland. Uh, and then they were apparently vacated until the last few thousand years. But in other cases, the islands were would have been continuously occupied. Um, so another thing that the team realized is that, uh, quoting, most of the Australian coastline has far more islands now than at any time in the human past. End of quote. This is because rising sea levels isolated previously landlocked uplands, turning them into islands. These island areas and altered coastlines provided new opportunities once sea levels stabilized. In describing these early excursions, this is what the authors say. These first voyages were intentional, involved over a thousand people, and were enabled by a culture of modern human behavior and maritime competency. Throughout the late place to see the authors observe that early seafarers appear to have maintained their maritime culture as they may migrated around the Australian coast with evidence of marine resource use throughout the late Pleistocene. So I find that uh, in modern human behavior throughout the late, uh, let's see, yes, uh, and were enabled by a culture of modern human behavior and maritime competency. Now we're talking 65,000 years ago. It's capable of sailing around the coast of Australia. Yeah, that's... Did you see the... <clears throat> There's the story about the Neanderthals sailing the Mediterranean so, yeah. 100,000 years ago? I've yet to see that story. That's, yeah, it's been out there. Now this is well authenticated. I'm I'd like to sure. see that. I mean, I've, I've, I know I read about it on our show, but um, well, there's. I, was... I mean, that would be something that wouldn't be. I mean, if you find Neanderthal remains on an island, yeah, that's what they're saying. There's like, there's no other way they could. They could. Here. Yeah. I mean, so they they've been through this, and I'm looking it up right now. There's a whole bunch of stories about it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I was reading a a news publication, not a paper at the time. Well, that's a good place to start. And if the news publication is of any merit or value at all, it's going to give the source and then you yeah. can go, go to the source and look it up. I mean, that's what I do. I know you Is that do what you that. do? That's mm -hmm. we, we have a yes. much lower standard on our show, right? <laughs> 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 just, you know, it was just like, here's a news story. Wow. That's crazy. All right. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> well, we got some more uh, donations and comments here. Okay. Uh, Mike check, uh, two bucks. Uh, Mike seems to be doing a little trolling in the chats, but I appreciate the donation, buddy. Troll all you want, I guess. Uh, Viking Viking Gaming, two dollars, says hello from New Zealand. Love what you all do. Thank you. Uh, okay, now when was New Zealand first populated? Hmm. Is this, right. Is this uh, controversial or is it? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm not gonna state an opinion on something i haven't really researched myself well i have heard i mean you know it i maybe i shouldn't say anything but i have heard that some people think there might be ruins there that could be very old but you know well maybe yeah. i don't know if that's a conspiracy or not uh well it did this day now with the things that we're discovering that doesn't seem like a big stretch to me right okay uh p atlantis five bucks says groovy thank you uh, really? Aggravated Trade, $5.50, says, Why is Hudson's Bay uh, look much like a circle on the southeast side? Appreciate everything you guys do. So, why Oh, did... well, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. That's the what he's referring to actually has a name, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it exactly right, but it looks like it would be something like, I can spell it, 
Nastapoka, N-A-S-T-A-P-O-K-A, the Nastapoka Ark. Uh, look that up, Kyle, just for the just for laughs. All right. <laughs> the Nastapoka Ark, yes. And uh, I think. All right. We'll the Nastapoca Ark is a geological feature located on the southeastern shore of Hudson Bay in Quebec, yep. Canada. Yep. It is a nearly perfect circular arc covering yep. more than 160 degrees of a 450 kilometer diameter circle. The arc yep. traces the coast of Quebec on one side and grazes the Ontario shore on the other. Due to its shape, the arc has long been suspected as the remnant of an ancient impact crater. Well, there yeah. we go. However, most scientists think that it is nothing important. No, I'm just they say they think it is an arcuate tectonic boundary formed when one shelf of rock was pushed down under another one. It is the only one on Earth so round that it looks like it was made punched out of a cookie cutter 280 miles across. So yeah, says the so uh, let me go to your uh, terrain view. And then we'll do a little share screen so people can see what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, share screen. Uh, let's see. So let's share screen one. I hope that works. Don't see anything yet. Okay. Then I need to just move this. I'm going to. Put this over on screen two. I think that'll work better. Then uh, I'm going to start over again. Man. I'm trying to find this paper about the Neanderthals, and it's I'm finding even wow, even even more. Others stuff. have suggested that hominids have been sailing for as long as a million years. Ooh, ooh, I'll nice. have to find this. Yeah, uh, I'll keep looking. <clears throat> All right, we see this. <laughs> See the yeah. map. Yep. Now, I I'm still going to lean towards a, uh, a remnant of an ancient impact crater because I don't I didn't hear anything that as far as you know what the alternate uh, interpretation is that didn't sound to me at all like there was anything there that's inconsistent with it being impact produced originally. And with this here, you've got the uh, the Nunavut. Let's see, agreement. Okay, you have these group of islands here. And those islands uh, could very well be part of a central uplift area, a central uplift feature right in here. I don't know, but it I I suspect that you know, given that there's no reason why we shouldn't to shouldn't think that the Earth has been pummeled at least as much as the Moon throughout its uh, existence, it should be not surprising that we could be able to find remnants of ancient impacts i mean there's nothing at all um you know uh outlandish about that so let's go to satellite view once here and see what it looks like okay we Ooh, i was going to suggest that actually randall if, if you do that there's there's a well you're zooming in but there's somewhere else i want you to look at that's that's up there okay you, you get a minute yeah all right, I, I did find a paper on the uh, Neanderthal stuff. Uh, sea early seafaring activity in the southern Ionian Islands is that in the Mediterranean? Yeah, that's off Greece. In the Mediterranean Sea, it's in the Journal of Archaeological Science, Volume Thirty Nine, Issue Seven, July Two Thousand and Twelve, pages two hundred and two thousand one hundred sixty seven to two thousand one hundred and seventy six. Okay, so it is there. It's published, peer reviewed. Stop share for a moment. And, and, and okay, so what does the abstract say? It summarizes the current development in the southern Ionian islands, prehistory, and places it within the context of seafaring. Archaeological data from the southern Ionian islands show human habitation since the Middle Paleolithic, going back to 110 KABP. Yeah, 110,000 years before present. Yes. Okay, so now we're back to 110,000. So that meant somebody had to be able to sail to those islands. Yeah. So somebody had some level of maritime skill 110,000 years ago. 
And who was it? Who were who? Now this so, was Neanderthals. Yeah. So it says. Um, How did they conclude they were Neander? Well, because Neanderthals were obviously there, right, on the Ionian got, Islands. Yeah, I think they've got yeah, DNA well, evidence, yeah. even. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll let's let's go on. Um, yet bathymetry, sea level changes in the late Quaternary geology show that the islands were insular at that time. Hence, human presence in these islands indicates inter-island mainland seafaring. Seafaring yeah. most likely started sometime between 110 and 35,000 years before present. <clears throat> and the seafarers were Neanderthals. Seafaring was encouraged by the coastal configuration, which offered the right conditions for developing seafaring skills according to the voyaging nurseries and auto uh, autocatalysis concepts. I'm not sure what those are. I'd have to look that up because I don't know either. But so this is very interesting stuff when people first started figuring out how to sail across the ocean. Right. So is it so outlandish to assume that people might have been able to sail westward from the Mediterranean as far as the Azores? I don't think so. No. I mean, why should that be? I mean, it's farther, I would say, than these journeys we're seeing here to the offshore islands of Australia or the Ionian Islands relative to Greece. But when we're talking about spans of tens of thousands of years, why is it out outlandish to think that, you know, this, this maritime skill could have developed to the point where you could make a transoceanic voyage? I mean, it just seems to me within that long a span of time for this thing to evolve, how could it not evolve? That's my question. How could it not, if they could sail hundreds of miles to islands offshore, why is it such a stretch to think that somewhere within there they were able to sail thousands of miles? And if that's possible, then, you know, that, how does that affect our concepts of prehistory? I, you know, it seems to me that we're looking at evidence that there was seafaring maritime skills tens of thousands of years ago. So given that fact, is it a stretch to a big stretch to say, yeah, tens of thousands of years ago, people were sailing the world. I don't think so. Yeah. Now navigating accurately, uh, launch, uh, yeah, longitude would be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that would be your big motive to learn astronomy right, right there. Yeah. Yep. Now you got a big seems incentive. Like it, seems like it was a big motive. A big for motive. A long yeah. Long time. <laughs> Man, can you think of it? There must have been some stories there that long forgotten that are just about as epic and powerful and interesting as any story ever could possibly be. Oh, yeah. I mean, you say, who were those first intrepid, heroic explorers in that vanguard of sailing out over the ocean? I mean, they probably just, died. They probably don't. <laughs> you're probably right, <laughs> Russ. It yeah, you're probably epic, right. It would have been an epic story, Russ. Yep. Change. <laughs> it would have been, but you had to kill it. <laughs> so, well, look, when, when, uh, you know, when the uh, air aerial, uh, when airplanes were first being invented, you had a number of attempts to cross the Atlantic in the air by oh, yeah. air yeah. that ended in fatalities. That's right. And that's what made Lindbergh's see those previous fatalities. And there was what, four or five of them attempts that failed before Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh did it. So having that context, that historical background leading up to his venture yeah. is what really kicked the, you know, his, the heroism of his efforts up the notch. If right. nobody had died and he was the first one, but he was coming on the heels of these attempts that had failed. Proved that it was very difficult and that, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. It underscored the, um, the whole, the, the, the importance and, uh, and value of, of what he did. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, yeah, so we've got this idea that it would make sense to me, too. I mean, think, we're going back 100,000 years. Within the last 100,000 years, it's likely that the Earth has gone through that glacial-interglacial cycle, or at least a stadial-interstadial, at least four times. So in those episodes, 
you know, in fact, it there was the um, the Emian, which is generally compared to the present Holocene, the closest analog to the Holocene, which I believe was around 105 to 115,000 years ago, right in there. So if the Emian was as warm as it is now, that means sea levels would have been high. And then you had a glaciation set in. So sea levels would have been dropping after 100,000 years ago. So with the sea levels rising and falling like they did, it seems like that would create in itself pressures to be able to navigate for the reason that we were talking about earlier. Because if you, you know, if your memory, your cultural memory includes the fact that you're on an island that was part of a mainland, well, there you go. You've got a huge incentive to try to figure out how to cross the ocean. And and it's likely that that the techniques and the technologies to cross the oceans would have been developed as the sea level is rising. Would only make sense. Right. Sea level's yeah. rising, and you're seeing that it's rising, and you're cutting out. You're being cut off from the mainland, and uh, so yeah, right there, the pressure to be able to cross that water is right there from the start. Yeah, and and then even later, uh, there would be legends that there was this amazing land, you know, across mm -hmm. the sea. It would it would spark curiosity, and certain adventurers would be like, "Let's go," you know. That's yeah. apparently what I mean, happened with the Vikings too. I mean, there was a memory there of of um, England. Oh, of England. Okay, careful now. You're getting Isles. into my territory. Sorry. I'm so just watch it. <laughs> We're not going to have any cultural appropriation here, Kyle. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Listen, Legends. if you start telling dumb Red, Swedes did your jokes, ancestors Kyle, raid the, the shores of England? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just, yeah, just as long as you don't start telling dumb Swede jokes. I, I knew I was going out on a limb there. I'm just saying that legends will also drive people to... Well, no, absolutely. Sport. I 100% yes. agree. 100%. That's, that's a huge part of the mix. So um, I, I still have... Let's see. Maybe I think I'm going to jump back to the screen share. Okay, and we got um, more more donations and comments too. Okay, so ja, I wanted people to see this. Look okay. at this. So if I yeah, zoom yeah. out, okay, there's the Nastapoka Ark. Wow. But then look right here. You know what that is? That is a tandem impact. That's an impact of two objects, a larger one and a smaller one. And here, this is this is really um, a good lesson in impact geology because the smaller one did not sustain or did not create a, a central, central uplifted uplift. ring the bigger one did of course you can see it's a lot of it's eroded away here because since this thing since like, these two uh impact scars were created this land has been subject to multiple episodes of glaciation and deglaciation yeah. so it's not surprising that the rim of the crater is totally obscured the central uplift uh, I mean, the central ring, there was probably an uplift. This might be part of, you can just barely make out something like a shadowed something. It's probably a shallow area right here under the center uh, that would have been the central uplift. But that's the clear water impact structures. And so this was two objects coming in side by side because they appear to be the same age. I so wonder. you would think, I mean, I think from the testing and stuff, it was concluded that they are the same age. So it's highly unlikely that they would be separated by any length of time at all, like say a millennia or even centuries and have them right next to each other like that. But if they're coming in as a pair, you've got a larger object and a smaller object and they're a, a gravitationally bound pair that's coming in, that would make more sense than that they're, you know, two completely separate independent events that just happen to be next to each other but that's in you can see let's see if we go out there pull out i would um, think it would be pretty common for some object that's not densely you know uh a ma fully metallic object that it's gonna hit the atmosphere and break up into at least two pieces would sure. be really common sure that 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 could be too these are big objects though Especially since they're so well, close. Yeah, they are. Well, well, it could be. Let's say they're already fractured. They're actually bound together, but 
they're not, you know, glued together. They're just, they've all already fractured. Just, you know, maybe they went close to the sun or Jupiter or the earth prior. We don't know the orbit of this thing, but it could have had close passages. And in those close passages, it could have fractured. So when it does come into the Earth's atmosphere, it's fractured. So you've already got essentially two pieces. Or they could have separated by a little bit. But anyways, look at this. I can zoom out and then scroll on down to this. You've seen this before, haven't you? Yep. That's where that's the, the, the Ma only Manicuaga. lake with an island that's bigger than the, than the lake. It's Atlantis. <laughs> You think that's Atlantis? Let's see if I can get Google it's Earth round. up here. Yes, it's round. I so don't think it's so. Of water. <laughs> Google Earth. You know, I wish um, Google hadn't gotten so politicized because I really like Google Earth and I really like Google Scholar. Okay, we're okay. Let me get around here to this. So let me see. Is this this is a natural lake, right? It's not, or is it? Is there some dams in here that are? Is this actually a reservoir? I don't know. But let's go to 3D for a second. So it's an ecological reserve. Well, now the question with Manicouagan is where is the outer part of the is this is this the extent of the of the crater of the astrobleme, or is it actually larger? And I think this is part of a uplifted rim that is of a much larger feature. Let's see if I can switch this and then we can spin it around. But this this could have been a uh, this could have been a, a mass extinction event, an impact on this scale. So what do you think? You think it can you make out? Looks to me, like am, am, thinking, am I hallucinating? But it looks to me like there's an uplifted rim around here. I do see like a hint of a big circle around. If that's yeah. what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, but that's I, what I'm talking about. Know. Yes. Like, like look that at this lake right is here. Actually, just around right? the central uplift. Look at this. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. So I think this one is close to 144 million. I've got a whole other slideshow where I've got all of the big major craters on Earth. I've de de dedicated one slide to them, and I've got all of the information in terms of uh, the research that's on the age, the energy of the impact, the diameter of the object, uh, or of the crater, the diameter of the object. Uh, so anyways, that's the, man hey, you know what we should do? How about a canoe trip around this? <laughs> How long would that take? <laughs> well, let's see. Okay, I can tell you. Let me pull out my trusty calculator here. <laughs> Let me stop share first of all. Okay, so we're looking at about 30 miles in diameter. Uh, okay, so oh, then man. we'll multiply that times pi. So that's 94 miles. Let's call it 100 miles around there. Can we wait till it's and frozen and skate around it? Mm, you snowmobile. can do that. I think I'm going to stick to a canoe. So <laughs> okay. if it's a hundred, if it's a hundred miles, it's probably a week long trip because you can, in a, in a lake, you could pull 15 or 20 miles a day in a canoe. Pretty, pretty easy. Mm. That's not out of the question. Do 15. Let's say, well, let's say if it took you 10, only 10 miles a day, like if you were taking it easy and camping along the way or something, it would take you about 10 days to do it. But I mean, yeah, I've, I've it paddled up five to, days in a row if you're not used to it. Right, if you're not used to it, exactly. So you would require some preparation. 
But that'd be a hell of a trip, let me tell you. What if we just got one giant canoe that had like multiple levels and rooms in it and it had a giant motor on it? <laughs> then we could do that. Would be cool. <laughs> oh well, okay. I was wanting to get a little primitive here. Yeah, if it had a you grill, know, we could barbecue, pay, bro. <laughs> pay, pay homage to our ancestors, <laughs> but no. Well, I want be, a motorboat. We'd be using a boat. It's close. Well, you know what? It's been around in for 100,000 years, man. <laughs> in the end, you would probably convince me to go a motorized watercraft of some kind. <laughs> hey, what about a fleet of pontoon boats, right? Is that get a big, big, have a big group? take a tour but hey we'd bring canoes along because you might want to take some little side trips in <laughs> there it. you go that's you, yes i mean you guys have done you guys have, doing, sure. yeah. you guys have spent time in canoes right we call them yep. dinghies yep we've been in canoes and dinghies and kayaks right yeah so well you know my dad was a canoe racer he built and, and designed and built racing canoes and then was a racer for about Oh, I don't know, 12 or 15 years competed. So there was canoes all around the place. And uh, <clears throat> I sure had a lot of fun with canoes as a kid growing up. So let's recreate my childhood. We'll, we'll, have, we'll take a canoe trip at the Lewis Bab Babel Ecological Preserve, e Ecological Reserve. So, Kyle, look up uh, Manicouagan and let's see when what the age dating is on that okay i'm gonna just for laughs <clears throat> yeah this might be tough let's see right uh, m-a-n-i-c-u-o man uh manny M -A -N. got it <laughs> yeah got i knew it. you could do it hey I, mean, I think i might have to throw you another <laughs> point two at a boy. So you're you're up to point you're one point seven now. Hey man, I'm getting there. All right. This is great. All right. It's a it, it covers an area of seven hundred and fifty square miles, or for those of you who use the metric system, a really big area. <laughs> the Lake Island in its center is known as Rene Levasseur Island. I'm probably okay. not pronouncing that right. Yeah. Uh, Kyle can correct me. And its highest point is Mount Babel. Very interesting. Yeah. The structure was created 214 plus or minus 1 214. Million. Okay, so that was around, I think, the beginning of the Jurassic. In the late Triassic by the impact of a meteorite. Late Triassic. Five okay. kilometers or three miles in diameter. Okay, so it's a confirmed impact structure. Yeah. Old right. one. And it did, didn't give the diameter of the ring? Um, we could I mean, work me, backwards. Me... You said 750 square kilometers or miles? Square miles. If you miles, want kilometers, okay. I can give you that. 1942. Kilometers? Mm -hmm. Square kilometers. Square kilometers. Yeah, but what's the diameter of the ring? You got Google Earth pulled up. Well, okay, you're right. <laughs> it's not giving me the diameter, but I'm looking. Okay, well, know. let's just, damn, you're right. I will do let's this right this. now, and let's see what the diameter is. Impact here. structure. Let's see here. Impact structure. Maybe that's uh, it's different. a little bigger than I said. It's it's 100. 38 miles in diameter. This says I said about 30. This says the impact crater structure is 100 kilometers in diameter. Oh no, T today visible to originally it was 100 miles, 100 kilometers and today it's 72 kilometers visible. Okay, so then that is not the ring here that it's talking about. What is the ring? Well, the ring, the lake ring is 38 miles in diameter. Yeah. So we're talking. Yeah. So, three so times yeah, that they're, time. they're, they're acknowledging that there's a bigger ring structure around this thing. Yeah. That's what we're seeing there. See what so I could, I could do a, a look here. If I go back to here, you'll see I've got right here. That's, uh, yeah. So stre stretch it out to 100 kilometers. And let's see what that okay. is. Well, let me just uh, clear it. Distance 38.6, start new. Uh, I, so you said 100 kilometers. Well, you do 62 so, miles. Yeah, so that would be 30 miles radius. Okay, there you go. 
So I'm going to just pull out 31. 30 mile radius. Well. Okay, not that much. Yeah, 31 miles. Well, that's not showing it that much bigger. No, but I can I can sort of see a smaller circular. I can, yeah, yes. Yeah, I, I see can that. see it. Yeah. yeah, I can see it right there. Interesting. So that's 31. So we, uh, is that what we said? Yeah, 31. So, that, so the lake is really just the deepest point between the outer rim and the central uplift. I mean, that's that pretty much it. That you got sense. that. Yep, there we go. Kind of halfway between. Okay, Kyle, another point two. <laughs> You're yeah. almost there. You're racking them up tonight, bro. What's happening? <laughs> well, you might as well show the oh. other one there, Prince Edward Island there over off. Uh, oh, yeah. Nova Scotia, Newfoundland over there. Before we do, let's revisit. Let's revisit uh, Clearwater. Got a bunch of donations and comments too, and we're getting yeah, uh, we up at the do. end on here on time here. We got to give these people their due. Yeah, time. Okay, okay. Well, hopefully they're finding this of interest enough. But I want you to look quick at Clearwater. Okay. The upper, the the the, the ro ro uh, eroded uh, central ring. Right now we're going to go out here. Brad said we should go and look at. Let me get back to the north. Prince Edward Island. Check this out. Look at this. We got to share it. Oh, oh. What's the problem? You can't see it when I don't share it? <laughs> that's, okay, yeah, that's, we... that's a weird issue. There it is. Yeah, look at this right here. So let me go back to Google Maps and we'll look at it through Google Maps. Right here, Prince Edward Island. And then I'm going to go to Terrain View. Oh, it was on. So this feature right here, and this, if you extend this, there's actually a circle right here. So maybe this is an ancient impact right here, and this is a remnant of the uh, uplifted ring. But it would be very old if it was. Now, one of the things I discovered let me see if I can do this. Let me see if I can uh, go back to Google Earth. And if I start. Yeah, maybe they can read some of the contributions there while you're. Yeah, doing go ahead. I think people will like this. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to draw. I'm going to just take uh, very roughly. I'm going to go to the center of this. To the center of Prince Edward. That's I got overshot it a little, but you'll get the idea. Okay, so you look at this distance. Now, if I divide this center from this center, and actually this is, should be moved a little bit, that I missed the center. Let's see if I can get a better. See if I can get a better. Uh, mm, there, that's about the center. Okay, so if I take this center, the distance from the center of the Nastapoka arc to the center of, oh, what's this bay? What, what is this bay called? The Gulf of St. Lawrence. And I divide that distance by the golden section. It's right here. Hmm. Which is nothing more than a coincidence, but I find it to be a very interesting coincidence that... That the center <laughs> of cool. Manicouagan divides. There are no coincidences, Randall. <laughs> this right at the golden section, right at at phi or phi. So, anyways, I just wanted to that share that. We'll stop share now. Let's go to some more questions, comments, whatever you got. Someone unseen, twenty bucks says, "Been waiting for another live show. Have some beer money as long as it's not for the uh, woke Bud Light." <laughs> Cheers from Australia. <laughs> P.S. Patiently waiting for the moon episode. Well, now that we've got our trips behind us, I'm waiting for Brad. Oh, he's putting it on Brad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brad is the one that's holding I'm it up, I'm waiting for Brad to get back to his studio. <laughs> I guess we could do it on the road. Unless, you know, unless, you know, you and I did it, Russ. Well, let's see. who's Who does Randall Reveals? Is that that's, that's Brad. Oh, the moon. oh, that's Brad? Yeah. 
You and I are oh. Randall responds. Okay. You and Brad are Randall Randall reveals. Well, who, 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 who <laughs> I, I when I heard the name of that one, I was like, I don't want to be on that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you did one with Peter Zelinka also. What about Peter Zelinka? You did a Randall reveals with him. Oh, I did, didn't I? Yep. Well, I could do another one, but okay. Uh, I was thinking you and me. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, but and, and that's don't the reason. Stuff on me, man. Let's go. I'll do it tomorrow. Okay. Well. Okay. That's Challenge good to know. Accepted. You're ready. Listen. I have to remember. We we talked about. This is not something that we can just do willy nilly. This has got to be planned out to some extent. Okay. So, folks, he's he's not actually and, waiting and, on Brad. And, and, and he look, has to plan it. Okay. Without going into <laughs> any specifics at all. Okay. The thing I did the other night uh, at. Uh, at the, the 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 meeting, the after in the, in the banquet room there when we all gathered together was sort of a rehearsal. It was good. Yeah, I thought it I was. I mean, yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah, and there's and so so that's what we're we're yeah. So it's coming up. Okay, it's coming. Okay, damn it, okay. I know it. I've said it for a couple of years now. It's coming up, and now it's going to come up very soon. Only, uh, you know, only one piece of the mystery, because we can only do one piece of the mystery at a time. I'm can, sorry. That's just can I just say goes. a little bit? Uh, I'm not going to say anything about the moon particularly, but about your presentation. Yeah. Okay. So you did this, I don't know, two hour presentation, but there's like, I don't know how many slides. What do you think? How many slides? 20, 30, maybe. Yeah. There's 200 and or maybe 300 slides in that presentation. <laughs> you got so much. Yeah. Well, that's true. It's a lot. <laughs> and then there's about 30 to 40 other presentations. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we need to start having maybe two podcasts a week. Yeah, we're way behind. Let's go. Well, I'm not going anywhere out of town until the Cosmic Summit. And we're all going to be there, right? We already out. do two podcasts a week, Randall. We can't do three. <laughs> Brad can. <laughs> Brad can do two podcasts a week, though. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have some alternatives going here now that Randall's got his own studio. We gotta start yeah. pumping out some more content. That would be for great. sure. Yeah. Yep. All right, uh, John John Lopez, five bucks says, "Could the Great Sand Dunes in the how do you say this, San Luis?" San Luis Valley. San Luis Valley, San yeah. Luis they're, Valley. They're by Crestone. Yeah, Colorado. Just... Could these be an indicator of the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis floods? Perhaps. I I wouldn't be at all shocked if the San Luis Valley wasn't a huge lake. And once it dried up and the wind is blowing and it blows all that sand up against the eastern rim there of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, I, I would think sure. I'm not going to stake my reputation on it because I don't know, but it's not implausible at all from what I know. Now, we'd have to get specifically, I mean, I've been through there. I've been to those dunes, um, but I don't really, you know, I haven't read any research on it uh, for a long, long time. Um, so I couldn't say, but yeah, that's very possible. I think the Bruno dunes, could in effect be the very similar, the ones in southern Idaho that were the distal end, the distal terminus of the outflow of the creation of Bruno Canyon, which is a very interesting place that I would like to explore more. And that what is it? Oh, I don't know how to pronounce it for sure. Oahe, Oahe. Um the one um Southern Idaho, you didn't, Bradley and I went there. We diverted off our, uh, our Snake River trip to go up the, the Bruno River. And uh, You mean the mountains in, north, in northern Nevada? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. I'm back to the uh, yeah, it's a, hair screen. It's the native name. I don't remember. But, yeah, I will say we went by the Bruno Dunes. And, uh, yeah, they're now offering uh, – like a sand board that you can 
you know, ski on, snowboard, sandboard. Really? Yeah, so we make that part of the trip, too. Well, I guess they're just big piles of sand, and they aren't, yeah, I don't. They are. We, we saw a couple of people doing it. Looked like Yeah, fun. we did. We did. They definitely weren't going, well, I mean, just this last week, they just, they weren't offering it when we were there before. So, yeah, pretty cheap, 15 bucks for like three hours, you get out there and. Okay, check this okay. out. This, the Bruno River has cut this canyon. Look at this. And here's an island. We, you got to share it again. Oh, oh, for gosh, darn it. Okay. <laughs> there you go. There we go. So if we come along, look at here, this tributary. So you've got, it looks like you've got some major upland flows coming off the uplands. I mean, this is the Bruno Canyon here. And you can see there's been a lot of material removed. Still look at this. Wow. Wow. And then let's see here. Okay. So it continues on. Let's zoom in here. So the river is still coming along here. And now you can see we're getting into all of this finer stuff. Let's see. Where is the, where is the, um, Randall, we got a bunch more comments and donations here and we're at the end. So. Well, let's go. Keep okay. throw them out while I'm looking here. All right, Mike. Uh, sorry if I get your last name wrong here. Mike Weigard, fifty bucks. Thank you very much. No comment. All right, there. Mike. So let's see what's Mike have to say. No comment. Just fifty bucks. Oh, okay. And then Just Mayo is a dollar fifty. Thank you. Daniel B twenty two dollars says, uh, "Do we have an estimate estimate on when the next great glaciation might occur?" Love the channel. Montreal in the house. That's a great question. Um, hopefully not in the next thousand years, yeah. but here's really all we've got to go on, you know, trying to look at ancient analogs and really, you know, like I mentioned the Emian earlier, we don't really find any ancient analogs to the Holocene other than short lived. And I say short lived five to 10,000 years is typical for those interglacial periods. So, you know, you tell me, this is one reason why there was a big concern in the 70s that we were headed for another ice age, which is actually kind of a legitimate concern, I believe, in my opinion. Um, so the answer to the question is, is I don't really know, but I hope it's not any time in the next, say, six months. <laughs> All right, Bill. Uh, Bill gives twenty dollars. Says Randall, "What would be the coolest thing to go see here in Wisconsin this summer if you were here?" Oh, could be well, a brag question there's, too. There's a bunch of stuff. There's a bunch of stuff. Um, we went to the outlet of Glacial Lake, Wisconsin, as it's called. I don't think it was a glacial lake at all. Um, the Dells is a really awesome place because it's the it's where this whole huge body of water that's called glacial lake wisconsin uh discharged and if i zoom over here to wisconsin and i zoom on in to the region of the dells let's see here where i'm at uh there's rochester okay here let me get down here and uh here we go, Wisconsin Dells right in here. So this was the outlet. If I go to Google Maps, you can actually see it clearer um, by zooming in. Here we go. Yes, so here's Wisconsin Dells. So Wisconsin Dells was the discharge point for this big flood that came down through this way. And you can actually see the pathway of it right through here. You can see here was a shoreline, and this area was overtopped. And then it, Gibraltar Rock, actually, we, Bradley and I went to the top of Gibraltar Rock 
And that marks the high water mark of this flood that came through here. So I, Gibraltar Rock, awesome. You can look down into the valley and know that when you're standing up on Gibraltar Rock, that that was the water was up to that level. And then you got Moon Valley, and then uh, there's Devil's Lake. Now, this was another discharge channel. Think uh, Devil's Canyon, guys, except for the fact that it makes this right angle turn. It's the same deal. You had all kinds of water that overtopped this ridge and cut down this channel. And so Devil's Lake is worth a visit. You can see on the map right here because this was a discharge point. And along both flanks of Devil's Lake, you see the huge boulder, the scree, the huge boulder deposits. I got a great, some great shots of Brad standing up in some of these boulders. And, and you can tell they weren't transported far because they're all very broken and sharp edge. But so the water came out this way. And then when you pull out, you can see that the modern Wisconsin is an underfit river because you can clearly see the the uh, deglaciation flood channel here and the modern river, which is Wisconsin River, which is very small compared to it. And then it comes down here and meets the Mississippi and has created a whole series of these large, you can see where it's eroded. This was the shoreline during the flood out. And then all of this is bottomlands in here. And uh, so anyways, that's what you could do. What was his name? Who asked this question? Uh, Bill. Bill, so if you, I don't know how much time you've got, but if I zoom out here, look at this. You can see this. Just the visit pathway, the whole state, Bill. <laughs> what's that? Just pretty much look at the whole state. It's really cool there. Well, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I'm trying to say that, look, that Wisconsin Dells is the discharge point of this whole area up here. Yeah. And what's happening is all this water is coming down and ponding at the Wisconsin Dells, and then discharging through the Dells and creating all of this weirdly eroded rock. And if you go out in this area here, see, they call it a lake, but it couldn't be a lake because there are islands in it, and the islands are only going to be formed by moving water. And if, let's see, there's one, what was the name of the one that we climbed there, Brad? Do you remember? Uh, look, look, here we go. Here we go. Uh, you Quincy said Bluff. I don't remember a different one. It was like 300 hey. feet, uh, several hundred stairs. Rattlesnake yeah, it was. A, that looked cool. Uh, here we go. Look at this. Look at this. So, see, there are these islands scattered throughout, and some of them have trails to the top. One of them, one of the most prominent ones, has actually they've constructed a stairway to the top. So it's it's quite a climb still, 300 feet up. But these islands stood above the water. Uh, here we go. Look at this. Roche A. Mound State Natural Area. Roche A. Is this, this isn't the one we climbed, is it? No, we, we hiked partially around that one. I think, oh. it was, I think it was just north of there or the one just south that you showed. Okay, you're probably right. So the, here's the point. These were islands in the flood. And mm -hmm. that flood came down, picture a funnel. It's coming down this way, this way, and it's converging right down here at Wisconsin Dells. So having that picture, I would say go to the Wisconsin Dells. Problem is uh, it's gotten really touristy. <laughs> um, yeah, you can yep. see from this picture here. Uh, that's a problem. But you can still do boat rides and still be worth doing to see the Wisconsin Dells. But then you could, uh, you know, split off of the tourist paths and go to these other areas. Devil's Lake, Lake State Park, yeah, there's tourists there, but it's mostly locals oh, and that stuff would that be, come out yeah, there. Yeah, that's, that's a cool feature right there for sure. <laughs> yeah, find all the oh, places named after the devil and go check that's those right. out That's right. That's basically what yeah. you need to do. <laughs> there and you go. That's a different direction. Hey, don't forget the Pesh to Go Fire Museum. Oh, there you go. Oh, all right, yeah, fine. which we'll is up there on... Uh, Get out by the lake if you want to do here, something there. Just south of Marinette. There it is right there. So yeah. you can always go there, but if you're if you're into, what did he specifically want? And you see a lot of drumlins. Cool too places that to way. go see. So basically, if the devil's in the name or it was ever on fire, you should go look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 Brad just brought something up. If you look at um, uh, Lake Winnebago here is a continuation of Green Bay, and you've got a big dump of of glacial sediment right in here that cuts it off. But if you clean the glacial sediment out. 
this would be a continuous discharge off the main pathway, which was Lake um, Michigan. But check this out. Now, if you come down here, picture this. This is still under the glaciers right here. And if we come down here, look at this. A drumlin swarm. A magnificent drumlin swarm. Look at this. That's pretty, that's a very impressive drumlin swarm that, that, uh, look over here. You can see that what's happening there is that the water is fanning out. Yeah, here we go. Look at this. And yeah. check out the, uh, the satellite view before you go and see which ones are like just grassy and you can really see them versus ones that are hidden in the trees. We also have a very impressive swarm of comments. We have to finish. Let's do it. Okay. See? <laughs> okay. People, well, we answered Bill. Mad. Bill, you got plenty of places to go, man. People get mad that their comments are not getting read. Okay. Let's. Some people are getting real bent out of shape Some in there. People. They're afraid that their comments are not getting read. Okay. Well, okay. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> we, we try, folks. Uh, I think uh, Ungoliant. I think five dollars says Randall. What's up with the moon? By the way, you are an awesome source for truth and enlightenment. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. I, I try to keep it up. I, I waver from time to time. I you know, I get caught with a, in a lie sometimes when but not too often. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Check no, donated another No, I try not to lie at all. I try <laughs> to tell the truth. Mike Check I might fudge the truth a little bit from now and then, but <laughs> doesn't everybody? Hmm. Okay, when next we... one. Mike Check donated another two dollars and said, Brad. Stop banning me. Yeah, I'm, Brad. It wasn't you, Brad, but yeah, you should actually ban this person. <laughs> <laughs> Common Sense 200, $5, says, Randall, is there, there is a YouTube channel called Apocalypse. The host, Matt Chin, has used uh, bathymetry scans on the Azores. You may want to critique his work. Sure. Uh, what what sources are used for those bathymetry scans? I don't know. Have something other than Google Earth? I don't know. We'll check that. That's the, that. Yeah. That's a main piece of research that's got to be done soon. Yeah. Maybe, maybe this guy is already doing some of it. Okay. What's the guy's name? I'm going to write it down. The YouTube channel is called Apocalypse. Simply Apocalypse. Yeah. That's all. And then Rex gives ten bucks and says geological cookies. I think he's talking about those two uh, impact craters we were looking at. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> undoubtedly. Mike Check comes back with another two dollars. Says, "I'm drunk. I will be nice." Okay, so you don't have to ban him, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Shell, our buddy Peter, gives one hundred and eight dollars. Thank you, Peter. Oh wow, thank Peter. you so much, Peter. I tell you, the more I get to know that guy, the more awesome he gets. Yeah, Peter's great. He is. He was a little reserved the very first trip. I didn't get to know him well. I don't think until the second or third one. Yeah, yeah, he's but, cool. Um, yeah, he's cool. Rex, another $10, says the color salmon is definitely Brad's friend. Looking good, buddy. Love the show. Thanks. <laughs> I think he likes your hoodie, Brad. <laughs> okay, 35906 Google Sucks gives $10. Says, I emailed Mr. Carlson a month ago, and he has not replied, but I want to take him and you guys to dinner the day before the Cosmic Summit. I wish to speak oh, with him. Okay. Okay, did he email me a Gmail? Or I don't a... know. I think he's using, back the contact. I he's using, contact, he's using the contact Us page on the website. I will go look. I, You know, I we get on the road. I spend so much time on the road, I, I lose track of... So what's his name? Uh, 35906 Google Sucks. That's his 3596, name. 3596. Okay, listen, man, I'll go back and look. <laughs> I might have overlooked your email, man, because I've gotten deluged with stuff. Doesn't Rowan get the uh, contact us stuff from the website? Who gets that? Yeah, so Rowan might have it. We'll track it down. Yeah. I'm writing this down, 359. And Rowan six. is Randall's brother. Yes. 30956, Google sucks. <laughs> Just so you know. 350? <laughs> 35906. Three, five, zero? Three, five, ah. nine, zero, 06. Zero, six. Okay, yeah. 359. I don't nine. know if that's going to be the email, but that's the... That's the username here. Well, I'll go back and look, and then I can probably reply. All right. What, 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 did he have a question? No, he just says he wants to take you to dinner the day before the Cosmic Summit. He has some things he wants to speak with you about. 
Okay, well, let me if I can work work it in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just not me- that I wouldn't want to. It would be just that, God, especially those two days leading up. But we'll see what happens. Maybe if you guys all come with me, maybe then I could. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, need to buy all of us dinner. <laughs> <laughs> buy <everyone> dinner. <laughs> all I need is beer. <laughs> That's all Kyle needs. Just Mayo beer. gives another dollar forty. Thank you, uh, Marcus Anderson. Says here's 100 Swedish gold coins for the Viking. There you go. Okay. It's 100 S E K. So. 100 S E K. Okay. And Damien, five bucks, says, "Is that story about bonus defeat from episode 61 real? What is that? I don't even know what he's talking about there." It is yeah. real. It's real. Okay. It really happened. That it's a gorge on the Tuckasegee River in North Carolina. And there's a, a an overlook. It's a large cliff, a couple of hundred feet high anyway. Um, quite spectacular. And it's called Bonus Defeat. Because what was it? The, the, do- the dog was chasing a bear, I believe. It was chasing something. Bear or and, a deer. A de- bear or a deer. And he belonged to his name. The dog's name was Bonus. Actually, I think it was like bonus, but it really was bone ass. Was the name of the dog bone ass? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. so, whatever, whatever the prey was, it maybe it was a deer. So the dog is chasing the deer, just about to to get it, and the deer suddenly diverts. I don't know which way, but suddenly takes a sharp right angle turn. The dog kept running, and it was right on the edge of the precipice, and the dog went over the precipice. And that was the end of Bone Ass. And so it was the defeat of Bone Ass. Okay, so, so it's a true story. It's a true story, yes. Hey, I'm about to lose power on both the devices I'm using. So right. I'm yeah, going to cut out here then. See y'all. All right. We're going to wrap this up. See you, oh, Brad. 35906 Google Sucks says he rented a seven-seater. He will buy us all dinner. His name is Josh. All right, Josh. Okay. You're on, dude. <laughs> Everybody's uh, got to change their plane flights coming in, though. Yeah, so just Josh Lee. Yeah, I'm gonna read the rest of these off real quick. We don't have time for the comments. We gotta. We're 20 minutes over already, guys. Uh, Counter stream two dollars. Bob five bucks. Damien ten dollars. That Satch zero two dollars. And David Carrier twenty two dollars. And Greg Mills twenty bucks. Thank you guys so much. Sorry we couldn't get to those comments at the end. Really, thanks guys. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, good show, Randall, Brad. I had fun. Yep. I think we Same learned here. a few things. Definitely. Kyle almost got to two attaboys. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever gotten one, so I'm yeah, way behind now. Break. Like, I, I have zero attaboys, pretty sure. I don't think I've ever gotten one before. You're racking <laughs> them up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Good it's, night, gentlemen. Uh, I, will, I will apologize for not getting more of the podcasts out there are several in the queue just need to be finished up the editing so they'll be coming uh pretty soon they'll they'll be at least three coming in the next month right awesome get back yeah yep. there's there's some good ones coming out and bradley and i will get together we'll do a randall reveals fantastic yeah. can't wait all See right y'all. yeah all right Enjoy it, guys. good night guys good night, good night chat good night. thank night you for gross. entertaining us you're awesome as always thank you very much see you next time Thanks, Super Chatters. All right.